What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monday, July 15th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand-Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, Trump shot in the ear at campaign rally. World leaders reacts absolutely unbelievable. We have to start off the show talking about the assassination wow. attempt, so we will cover it from all angles and attempt to weave in what this does mean for the energy markets, but really it's just a sad day in the United States. Next up, the green no deal. Oil and gas still rain despite renewables. Enormous handouts. We've got to love that. Next up, the media scapegoats fossil fuels for heat waves, but experts say asphalt cityscapes are the real culprit. Interesting. Love a good zig when everybody's zagging. Next up, Western companies are now paying for Russian shanks sanctions. Excuse me. That's right. You're paying for Putin, guys. All right. Finally, global push for renewable energy falls short of targets. Stu will then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets on Friday and touch on an, another surprising rig count drop. We will cover all that and a bag of chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. I think we know where we want to begin this show, though. Holy smokes, dude. Trump shot in the year at camp- campaign rally. World leaders react. Michael, I just want to say I am, our hearts go out for everyone that was there, the family of the deceased. That's the first thing. President Trump, what a fighter. This really got me worked up. (laughs) I'll tell you what. I wouldn't have thought that. Oh, I am so grumped out. Now, here we are. For our podcast listeners, I'm pulling out, do I wear my army hat or do I wear my Trump hat? I don't really care anymore. I am going to wear this hat with pride everywhere i go and to anybody that's in my family screw you i'm wearing the hat well you heard it here second vote first off this is an official endorsement for Stu. i can tell you i'm shocked oh yeah hey by the way hats off to the secret service that did step up but i also want to say there are rumors out there saying who to blame i'm going to say this michael the who to blame on this There are the, what, the eight Democrats that filed for legislation to remove Secret Service. They need to be thrown out of Congress. The other one is President Biden. President Biden called on this and said there was going to be some changes happen this weekend. He telegraphed some things. I'm not going to get into that. But there are things that the shooter, that the sniper, that actually was the police sniper, there are rumors, and I don't have this verified, but I have sent it to Dan Bongino for verification. He said he was told to stand down, Michael. I'm not going to say that that is the truth, but I am saying I'm asking for Dan Bongino to check that one out. Because if the Secret Service did ask him to stand down, that is a failure. And the DEI of the David Blackman put out a video of it looked like Keystone cops, the females trying to protect Donald President Trump is pathetic. I am sorry. I am all worked up on this. I saw one tweet that said this looked like an episode of Reno 911. And if you've ever if you've ever seen that show. It was really true. You know, first off, obviously super scary. It is kind of incredible to think about the, the, as this article goes on to talk about how strong the world leaders have come out and condemned this and how little our, our own government has come out to release this. I mean, I'm an avid New York times reader and I just thought he fell off the stage until I actually saw the video. And then said he fell off the stage. It was insane. I mean, you, you, within five seconds of watching the video, you knew what happened yet. You had, you had all these people trying to tiptoe it around because let's make it very clear. It, Trump's going to win in November. I mean, if there was any doubt of him winning, he, this blew it out of the water. This changed it for not only for me, I am done pussyfooting around with anybody telling me that, oh, we got to be nice. I'm sorry. The gloves are off, dude. And this is now a battle for the survival. And do not kid yourself. The deep state. Here's where I've been very vocal about this. General Flynn. You are now needed as our vice president more than ever. We need you to clear out the deep state for four years as VP and then eight years as president 
General Flynn, you have an open invitation on this podcast. And by the way, we need you to clear out the deep state. Well, and there really is no way to tie this into energy. So I think we'll, ju- we'll just stop it here. I think it's a sad day for America. We decry any type of violence. So hopefully there's no retaliation. No. This should be a consolidation and a coming together. And obviously I think in November, it's going to be pretty clear what's going right. to happen. And we'll cover on down the line in the eventual victory about what this means for the oil and gas business. But exactly. for now we just decry violence and we hope Everybody can at least now, Trump's okay, take a deep breath and hopefully move on to to, to, to trying to figure out and help fix what's going wrong in this country. But I agree. What's, but what, what's up next? Let's, let's just say this. I have always defended those around me. I have never made a first violent, I will defend people around me. And if anything happens around me, I will throw my life on the line for folks. That is something I have done, period. So- All right, let's go to the Green No Deal. Oil and gas still rain despite renewables' enormous handouts. I'll tell you what, Michael. Despite more than $4 trillion in global spending on renewables, wind and solar from 2004 to 2022, Fossil fuel consumption grew 3.4 times faster. <laughs> Not year. What you wish this. for? Oh, yeah. No, but think about how much money and cost of capital that is. Not a year ago, the New York Times headline screen, clean energy future is arriving faster than you think. A decade earlier, Guardian said how wonderful low carbon future was just ahead if Britain would stop subsidizing coal and oil and gas industries by $4.2 billion a year. They get it confused, Michael, in every one of those stories that they were talking about. There's a difference between tax incentives and subsidies. They were calling tax incentives. I mean, there is a huge difference. Shocker that journalists can't, aren't, you know, don't do enough research to understand the difference between subsidies and tax and 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 tax incentives. You know, right. color me shocked. Listen to this. And oil and gas and coal received less than 15% of federal support or not even a third of what was gifted to renewables. There is, and that is a difference because that number is actually kind of wrong because it's a tax incentive. In order to get a tax incentive it means you got to have profits. I mean, it, it is really unbelievable. This next line, overall global spending on green energy, which includes nuclear, and I, I'm okay with that and always should, will exceed $2 trillion, twice the $1 trillion in expenditures on fossil fuels. And I've heard that we need to spend $4 trillion just to meet decline curves for a stagnant demand curve, Michael. Yeah, I mean, we've been the first That's ones. That's high I've been, prices for oil coming. I'm with you. I've been the first one to call out the tremendous amount of negligent spending that's happened to the oil and gas business. Trust me, I've seen money spent on projects that have no need to be spent on. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't. You, you are absolutely right. Because of the declining nature, I mean, they're called decline curves for a reason, because they exponentially decline. You have to put, pump money into this. The fact that we're going to, we're spending over 100% more on renewables than we are fossil fuels is just absolutely incredible and really tells you where the subsidies are. Right. This, that stat right there really tells you where the subsidies are, because it, if there were more subsidies in fossil fuels... Trust me, these green energy people would be dumping it all into fossil fuels. Trust me. Well, the AI has now squirreled this out and really kind of ruined it for everything because now the big tech is needing a lot of energy. And in the article by Robert Bryce, he says uh, gas-fired power generation grew 9.5 times faster than wind and solar combined. Wow. Wow. Crazy. All right, what's next? Let's go to media scapegoat fossil fuel for heat waves. But experts say asphalt cityscapes are the real culprit. Go figure this one out. Heat waves bring a barrage of dramatic reports. Commercial pizza ovens are closer to a thousand degrees, and home baked pizza ovens are cooked below 425 and 500. But they're saying that it's comparable to a pizza oven. I'm going to call 
We're yeah. living in a dangerous new era of more frequent, destructive, and deadlier disaster fueled by humanity's continuing spewing of greenhouse gas pollution, the Times reported. I'm going to disagree. Heat flux is a fancy scientific word for heat. It includes the heat narrative off pavement, as well as heat from air conditioning, air conditioners, and cool space by moving heat, which is then rejected out. I mean, think about it. Pavement. You ever try to walk across the, the pavement? Well, it's it's black. And this is interesting. So Chris Martz, he's an at atmospheric science senior at Miller's. So, I mean, th now we've got we've got people in college now who are making more sense than the experts. You've got people in college making more sense than the experts. He compiled data from the global historical climatology or no, he told the global global historical climatology network daily that he compiled data from five stations around the D.C. metro area which have spring average temperatures going back to 1893. The data, according to a college, someone in college, found that there is no warming trend since at least 1921 in the rural and suburban areas surrounding D.C. Right. But... In 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 the there's a 12 percent rise in urban areas. Right. You know why? Because where the sensors are located, they build up around sensors and then they don't bother to go change them out and do that. There's a whole nother set of articles and everything else about urban heat and how they're me measuring it, Michael. It's unbelievable. Uh, well, there's this other quote here. I'm trying to find the guy's name. Dr. Alec Feinberg. He's a climate solitist, scientist. Listen to this. This is one of his quotes. Do, 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 do. Where is it? If the roads were concrete, we would have about 5.5% less global warming. So in other words, we can make them more reflective because concrete is about four to five times brighter. But how much more concrete does asphalt than asphalt because CO2 has to burn coal and it's not just any coal. It has to be the coking coal at higher temperatures in order to create it. I'm with you, so but but if assuming his analysis took that in, you're still better off having concrete than what we have right now is asphalt. So, again, right. it's clear the elites, they don't care about global warming. They no. care about sucking more money out of your pocket. And however they can do that, that'll be their new scheme. I would agree. Hey, let's roll over to our buddies over there. And Western companies are now paying for Russian sanctions. Great. European and U.S. Com companies still have billions of dollars in assets in Russia. And Moscow is starting to retaliate. I'll tell you what. This is unbelievable. Michael. One little fact before we get into this article. Before the war, Ukraine, Russia spent, I believe it was 75% of the transactions in Russia were in U.S. dollars. They're down to less than 20%. That is a statistic that is going around the world and why the value of the dollar will go down eventually. People don't need the U.S. dollar anymore. Quote, unquote, our country has significant amount of Western funds and property that are under Russian jurisdiction. All of this may be subject to Russian retaliatory policies and retaliatory actions, said Maria Zokoa, spokesperson for Russian's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Of course, no one will disclose the nature of those retaliatory actions to you, but the arsenal of political and economic countermeasures is wide. The man's in charge of bricks this year. I mean, he's going to escalate everything he possibly can to go around the world on this. Yeah, so according to some analysis done by the Kiev School of Economics and I mean, a Brussels-based think tank, well, I'll leave my yeah. comments aside for what I think of a Brussels-based think tank, but they claim that since 2022, 40% of all you know, European and U.S. companies have pulled out about 40 percent of their Russian assets, but there are still foreign assets worth about 194 billion in Russia. Of those assets, 32 billion are owned by U.S. companies, while another 90 still belong to European countries. So it's proving harder to get out. And as we always say, at the end of the day, the consumer, you, takes it in the shorts. Exactly. You know, it, it's like there's a Russia in Germany. There is a Russian Russian refinery that they are now confiscating. And that is that is just, you know, guys, you need to learn how to negotiate with Putin rather than confiscate, my opinion. 
Yeah, it's, I mean, two things can be true. We cannot like food, but we can also think what this entire charade that's going on is inappropriate in order to handle the situation. I mean, people don't think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can. We do it all the time. You may be. I don't. But, you know, the, the, the one thing is don't ever underestimate Putin and negotiate. He understands negotiation. So, I mean, look what he did to the sanctions. They sanctioned the the EU and the U.S. sanctioned the snot out of it, and he's risen the income per capita at, in Russia to now the fourth in the fourth in the world. Okay, let's just let's just be clear. Yes, that is a true fact. But why is that true? Well, they have a commodities based economy. The commodity price, specifically for oil, which is their biggest export, has gone up about twenty percent relative to twenty twenty two, and now. Now, you could say that was that's got nothing to do with Putin and has really everything to do with the con, you know, a, a large yeah. amount of of fragmented energy policies coming to case. So, yes, he has done that. A lot of it is just because he's gotten lucky with oil prices. Let's just put it out on the tape. I'm going to throw this at it, though, that he helped develop the dark fleet and get around the sanctions through mechanisms and purchasing in Indian rupees but no one he's not controlling the oil price that's just they, no he's they, not they, controlling the oil price but he's gotten around the sanctions and improving business so anyway let's go to the next one here global push for renewable energy falls short of targets i wonder why current decarbonization efforts are insufficient to achieve the ambitious goals set during comp 28 Really? Despite renewables becoming the fastest growing power source globally, maintaining and exceeding this growth rate is crucial for surpassing fossil fuels in installed capacity. It's not going to happen. I hate to tell you that. The report identifies uh, regional disparities with Asia leading in renewable power generation closely by North America. Renewable capacity at the end of 2023 accounted for 3.9 terawatts or 43% of the global capacity, making a significant 14% increase from 2022 in establishing a compound annual growth of 10% from 2017 to 2023. Where these numbers do not take into consideration, Michael, is the fact that you they're not counting for the standby power that has to, the dispatchable power, like in new natural gas and in coal plants, that they either have to leave on or add in to support it. So these numbers are not actual. Yeah, I mean, it. the targets that people set and that were set during COP28, it doesn't take a genius. We don't need another study. We might need another college student to tell us, hey, I don't think we're going to be able to meet this. I like this one. COP president, Dr. Sultan Al-Jabbar. Today's report is a wake-up call for the entire world while we are making progress. We're off track to meet the global goal of tipping renewable energy's capacity to 11.2 terawatts by 2030. I can't see it happening, dude. Yeah, I mean... You there, there's a lot we could say, but if you thought this, hey, we're going to be net zero by 2030 was actually going to happen. I mean, I've here I've got I've got some investments I'd like to sell you. Trust me. Yeah, I had a joke, but I'll leave that alone. Look at the restraint being held by Stu, because who knows what that could have been. We would have cut it if it was bad, but <laughs> we were able to catch it in real time. Let's go ahead and jump over and cover oil prices before we do that, guys. As always, we got to pay the bills around here. Uh, thanks for checking us out, w.energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all your energy and, and oil and gas news. All of the news and quote-unquote analysis that you just heard is brought to you by said website. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Hit that description below for all of the links to the articles, timestamps, so you can jump around and, and, and go back and hear what we had to talk about, the Green New Deal, jump up and talk about where rig counts are going to go, anywhere you need to go. You can also hit us up, theenergynewsbeat.substack.com, where you can check out all of the articles that we're going to cover. We obviously record this uh, the day before we release it, so you can, uh, if you subscribe to our Substack, which I highly recommend, and you do, you can get all of those articles before and get tomorrow's news today. But let's go ahead and jump in here, Stu. You know, markets on Friday actually, you know, didn't fare too well. I mean, they fared okay. We had a little bit of a tumble off on the end, but we did see overall.
overall S&P 500 was up about a half a percentage point. Same with the NASDAQ up about a little above a half a percentage point, 0.59 percentage points. Two-year yields tumble 1.3 percentage points. Ten years only down about a quarter or three quarters of a percentage point. Dollar index down about four tenths of a percentage point. We see Bitcoin now still under $60,000, but barely sitting at $59,984. For crude oil actually did tumble a little bit. It was down about a half a percentage points, 82 21 and does look to open here as we record this here on the 14th in the afternoon looks to open a little bit below that but i have a feeling with with the events that took place we are going to see a, a slight overnight rise so as you listen to on a monday i i would wager to bet we're above that 82 dollar mark but but that will remain to be seen brent oil 85 35 it's only down about three about three tenths of a percentage point nat gas spikes a little bit after again what's coming a, a pretty intense heat wave three dollars and 32 cents so still still down but but up a little bit all you nat gas bulls you know we're, we're, we're trying over here you know really what we're seeing is is you know investors are really weighing what we saw on friday which was a lot of which was some pretty weak com- consumer sentiment data and the fact that there may or may not be more rate cuts coming a monthly survey that was released by university of michigan showed u.s consumer sentiment fell to an eight month low in july although we did see the u.s labor department producer price index or the ppi rising by point two percentage points in Ju- in june which was slightly more than expected as though the cost of services did climb still we are hoping that the feds will come out and start cutting rates in december phil flynn an analyst over there at price futures group says the market isn't afraid of the fed at this point i'm still afraid though so i don't know if the market is but trust me i'm still afraid we have yeep g wrong a market strategist over at ig cooling u.s inflation numbers may support the case for the fed to kickstart its policy easing process earlier rather than later it also adds a series of downsides surprises in the U.S. economic data, which points to a clear weakening of the U.S. economy. We also saw on Thursday and Wednesday, again, we saw EIA crude oil and natural gas storage inventory numbers. We did see that U.S. gasoline demand was up to 9.4 million barrels per day, which is the highest since 2019 for a week. That includes Independence Day. Jet fuel demand was also on a four-week average basis at the highest it was since January 2020. We also also did see crude oil or rig counts drop by uh, Baker Hughes. If we can go ahead and put that image up here. Week over week, we saw a, a drop of still one rig. So we're down to 584 rigs. That's still that's also down 91 rigs from where we were in the week ending July 4th last year, uh, July 14th last year. Canada saw an increase of 14 rigs. So hey, drill baby drill in Canada, we saw four rigs increase internationally, 557 internationally. And for Canada, you're up to 180. 89. So a mixed bag in terms of that U.S. economic data. We Again, we saw a slight drop in oil prices, but I think things are mudding the water. You know, outside of that, we, have, we, we had to delay the podcast with, with our friend John Farrell to in, in terms of covering Devon Energy and swooping up Grace and Mills. So we're going to record that here on Wednesday, try to get that out that in the next week and a half. But I've been diving into all things that deal. Really interesting for Devon. I'll be honest, my initial reaction is still, I'm not sure if I like it from the standpoint of, I, I just don't see this and I don't mean synergies it just seems like Devin made a deal to make a deal you know you start diving into you know their acreage versus where Grayson Mill is Devin is you know if you go read their Q1 earnings report they talk zero right. about the Bakken and now they go and buy a company that's solely based in the Bakken it just it seems to me that they felt like they were the the last person at the table without food and just had to grab something and ended up with and while I like Grayson Mill as a business I think they've done an excellent job they got a great you know end cap you know obviously does a great job of putting together these deals you know they seem to have come out okay I like everybody at Grayson Mill but just from a strategic standpoint on from Devin's side really interesting wouldn't have thought that they were the buyer I know that you know John and I were talking that you know we really thought the the, the new Cord Enterplus merger was lining up to buy them and you might have saw another actual right. merger and not necessarily an acquisition, but Devin swoops in and buys them outright. So super interesting. Oh yeah. I can't wait to see it when you guys get actually get down to it. It it, it takes a lot of work. I Luckily we can just come on this podcast and riff a little bit. Got to do a little bit more research for those deal spotlight podcasts. So what else you got Stu? What should people be worried about this week? Well, hug your family. We just don't Mm. know how quickly things can change for us. And I know for one, I will be very vigilant as things go for your 
forward. Yeah, keep uh, keep enough gas in your tank to be able to make it up to the bunker. Trust Absolutely. Me. So, <laughs> all right, guys. Well, we hope you had a great weekend. Stay safe out there. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll let you get out of here. Get back to work. Thanks for checking us out. World's Greatest Podcast. Check us out, www.energynewsbeat.com. We'll see you tomorrow.